Hello, I'm Dr. Pierre Simon, and it's wonderful being back with you as we continue in our series, Parenting with Purpose. Those uh, wonderful times when we're so scared, uh, are we gonna do it right? And then after a while, we start to get used to it and we get, we get better at it, but it's a constant learning as we're gonna be talking about. So essential qualities of effective parents. What are those qualities that I need as a parent? Uh, what qualities do you need? We're all different, we're all unique persons. So I might need something you don't need. You might need something I don't. And as husband and wife in parenting, we make a team and we utilize those strengths and uh, to offset the weaknesses. And that doesn't mean you have to be a perfect person to do it all. No, when, when you're united together, you're a team, you're doing it together, you're enduring things together, you're, you, you become stronger together. And that's the purpose of our relationship. One of the purposes of our relationship with God is He makes us stronger together. And so when I'm with God in relationship, I'm stronger. When I'm with my wife, who's now in heaven, but when I'm with my wife, uh, I'm made stronger and she's made stronger and we're both made stronger in the Lord. It's, it's that uh, three chord coming together, uh, that concept of added strength. We can get through anything with God's help, even parenting, although sometimes you scratch your head and you go, oh, what have I done? You, know, you wonder, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get through this? You look back on it all and you see that you did, and you will too. So achieving patience in parenting is what we're talking about today. We spoke about the importance of empathy before and consistency the last time. Today in part one of, of patience in parenting, we're gonna look at some of those aspects and then in part two, we're gonna uh, talk about some of the strategies to develop more. Uh, patience, which we can use in every area of our life. Achieving patience in parenting, uh, we might look at that and think uh, of a, a silly little joke. Why, why did a parent bring a ladder to the parenting class? Because they heard that the best way to achieve patience is to step up their game. Yeah, I got to step up my game, you know, when I'm thinking about parenting when I was younger. Uh, I got to do better, I gotta work harder, I have to keep learning, I have to grow. If I'm a know-it-all, there's nowhere to grow, I know it all. Unfortunately, bad things are gonna occur to know-it-alls. And I think when that occurs, we need someone to teach the know-it-all, they don't know it all, and let's work at it together so we can get better at whatever it is, particularly at parenting. So patience in parenting is an ongoing journey that requires thoughtful preparation, deep empathy, steadfast compromise and composure, and a commitment to continual self-improvement. The know-it-all doesn't need to self-improve, do they? Oh, I can do anything. I know everything. There's no room for self-improvement, so they learn the hard way. They learn through trials and errors. And unfortunately, for those that are steadfast in that being a know-it-all, they still don't learn. They keep repeating, and it gets worse, and the consequences get worse as well. And in parenting, unfortunately, the consequences get handed down to the kids, and they grow up with those consequences, and that's what we don't want. And that's one reason why we're talking about developing and achieving these important characteristics as a parent uh, in helping us or in helping pass this along to our children or grandchildren or friends, relatives, and whoever else. Patience is vital. Enabling parents to manage difficult situations with composure and insight rather than reactionary haste. The know-it-all is reactionary. They're constantly, I'll do this and I'll do that, reacting to whatever without thinking through what the reaction is going to uh, result in. And sometimes we have to pause, as we've spoken of before, and think through whatever it is 
But if I know it all, then I don't want to show someone I don't know it all. Therefore, I have to be quick and fast and stubborn and determined and legalistic and rigid. Well, we see that that doesn't turn out very well in most cases. Exhibiting patience isn't merely a master, a uh, matter of temperament, but a strategic approach that enhances communication and problem solving, which is crucial in nurturing a child's development. And that's what we do as parents. We're nurturing the development of that child. We're not pounding, pounding them to shape them into something. We're nurturing them to develop them. The, the good stuff's already in them. It's up to us as parents to develop the good stuff so it comes out, so it can be seen and enjoyed. This poised approach promotes a learning environment where children can thrive emotionally and intellectually. Patience in parenting extends beyond that conflict, uh, beyond punishment and rules and pointing that finger. It's an atmosphere uh, where children feel valued and, and understood. If you feel valued and understood, you grow, you thrive from that. If you feel put down, criticized, condemned, you curl up, you, you don't thrive, you shrink. Such an environment is conducive to teaching children when it's a thriving environment, when it's an environment valuing them and helping them to feel understood. And it gives them a sense of uh, regulation and resilience. You know, they, they now have a self-discipline uh, that they're able to control themselves um, in, in handling things. And of course, they don't do that at first, but they're developing it as they're getting older, just as you and I are still developing it because from the day we're born to the day we go to be with the Lord, we're learning, we're growing, we're developing. Our potential is still in us and we're releasing that potential as each year goes by we're thriving and new things are coming out and we start to see, oh, I didn't know I had that ability or I didn't know I could do this or that. That goes on all the way until we go to meet with the Lord. It's the know-it-all, the entitled and so on who they stop at some point. They can't go any further because they've shut themselves down. They're not thriving now there's an illusion that they're thriving at the expense of everyone else, the supply of everyone else that they draw from. When parents consistently model patience, they manage their stress more effectively and impart lessons of perseverance and calmness when they're in their children. The children are watching you. They're going to take on your identity over time and if you're a safe parent, if you're a loving parent, a trustworthy parent, they want to be more like you. If you're not, you know, you know what do you, you know, some may say, I go, okay, I got to be like them to be safe. So they become just as bad as you or as mean as you or whatever. And others say, oh, I'm not strong enough. I, I can't handle this. They escape and they escape through maybe running away or they escape through drugs, alcohol, um, or other means of escape. These qualities are essential for children to develop coping mechanisms. We're passing along those qualities. Now, I might not be a perfectly patient person, but I'm teaching patience or I'm, I'm demonstrating that I'm trying to be patient or I'm making little efforts that are showing improvement in being patient. And they're watching this. They're experiencing it themselves. They're at the receiving end of it. And, and then I draw from, perhaps I draw from my wife's patience if I'm impatient at a particular time, or you might draw from your husband's patience on, on certain things. The kids are observing that. They're thriving as they're learning and experiencing. So dealing with disappointments and challenges are always going to be there. We just want to try harder to do better 
for the next time. Resilient children are more adept. In other words, resilience is being able to be flexible, yet firm or strong when needed to be, but flexible, uh, adaptable, able to make adjustments when necessary. That's a resilient person. When you get knocked down, you're able to pick yourself up and keep going. It doesn't mean you have to be bitter and angry and all that to do that. It just means you have to be resilient. And resilience is learned early in childhood, adapting at facing setbacks and are better prepared to turn potential failures into learning opportunities. What can I learn? How can I learn from this? How can I grow from this experience? This resilience is critical in every stage of life, promoting mental and emotional health. When a child is unduly punished, are they going to adapt in a healthy way or in an unhealthy way? Are they going to uh, endure that undue punishment or severity of punishment through learning and growing? Or are they going to be stifled and incorporate what they're learning to pass it along later? And oftentimes that's the case. But it still depends on the child because temperaments are different. Combinations of temperaments are different. The National Christian Counselors Association has a temperament profile that's computerized and it's more accurate than the paper ones that it can break down your temperaments into three main need areas as we've talked about before. Well, so that child, you can have four children and each one turn out a little different with the same parenting. However, the difference is based more on that inner identity that they have within them and how they're perceiving uh, the world around them uh, and what their inclination is towards the reaction that they're going to have towards whatever is happening to them. And when that occurs, you're gonna have some differences. So one set of rules may not work for every child or one uh, the principle may not work for every child. You may have to be resilient in your parenting in helping your children to grow and thrive based on who they are, not erasing their identity so they can be just like you. Biblical basis for patience and parenting. Well, the first thing I think about is the fruit of the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit as that foundational biblical basis for everything that we need to be and do. It's the result, uh, it's the good that comes out of those things. Patience as a fruit of the Spirit is not just a virtue, but an integral part of a Christian's character, a testament to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, when I was growing up, I used to like to watch movies on TV and uh, uh, TV programs and all that. And I'd watch these, you know, Western movies and, and cowboys and Indians and all that. And, and then the Crusades, you'd often see those, those kinds of movies. Well, that kind of put a mindset in my mind that Christians should be out there warring and all that. And then as I grew older and I began to learn more, especially after uh, re re letting go of, of my will to the Lord and, and becoming a Christian, uh, uh, believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, suddenly I saw that differently. Wait a minute, that wasn't the way it's supposed to be. Christians aren't supposed to go on war. Now there might be wars where we have to defend ourselves and protect ourselves, but we're not supposed to go and develop a crusade and, and uh, uh, do this and do that, like the movies that, that we watch. Yet that was the depiction of it all. And that depiction sometimes gets in the minds of parents. Well, I've got to be strong and punish and, and uh, demonstrate and, and control. And no, nah, it, it doesn't work very well. The evidence, the research is definitely showing 
that doesn't work very well. So patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Wait a minute, uh, is that going on a crusade, wiping out people or proving you're right and they're wrong or proving you own this and they don't? No, fruit of the Spirit is connected with love. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 23 to, uh, 22 to 23, Paul lists the, the, the fruit, and that fruit starts with the spirit of love. Uh, and, and he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, forbearance is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I can't make myself be that way. But if I'm doing the things, following the modeling that God has given us, that fruit is going to start coming out. It's going to start being displayed, patience being one of the fruit. So patience is explicitly mentioned in here as forbearance and in the fruit of the Spirit. Cultivating patience is uh, seen oftentimes not by my might, but by the Holy Spirit's guidance, counsel, instruction, impressions. Then I have to act on it. I have to carry it out. So in order to do that, I have to realize that the foundation of it all is love. Patience is love. Doing something for your children because you're the parent and you have to do it, that's not love. Feeling resentful that you have to tie the shoelace, that's not love. Love is enjoying to tie the shoelace, demonstrating over and over again how to do it, so eventually it becomes a part of that child themselves and they want to do it themselves because they see your enjoyment in doing it for them. They want to enjoy doing it for themselves and maybe do, and tie your shoelaces as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, often referred to as the love chapter, provides a profound insight and, and other insights into the nature of love. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. It starts off with the bottom line of all of this is love. I don't care what religion you belong to, what group you belong to, what organization or family or whatever. They can say they have love, but are they demonstrating it? Is it being seen in their modeling? And if you see fear, domination, threats, and so on, is that love? If you saw a parent doing that to a child, is that love? It all comes down to that, doesn't it? The evidence needs to be there. This foundational text that we just looked at for Christian ethics emphasizes true love is inherently patient. Again, the fruit, it comes out when there's love. It's visible when there's genuine love. If there's not genuine love, you don't see the visibility of patience. It's, it's hard to see in that person who is resentful or bitter or punishing. For parents, this implies a commitment to enduring the trials and challenges of raising children with a steadfast and loving heart. Sometimes I didn't feel very loving as a parent, and I would turn to my wife and say, I think you need to handle this right now. Yeah. And sometimes she might not feel it, and she would turn to me and say, oh, you, you take care of this. I've, I, I can't, I've had enough of this. Yeah. That's parenting, isn't it? That's, that's why it's so important to be together, stay together in marriage, work through the difficulties, deal with unconditional love.
because that's the love God has for us, that unconditional love. We want to have that unconditional love with our children. Patience in parenting, therefore, is an extension of the love parents have for their children. I think when I'm following that principle, I do better. When I don't, I realize I'm being selfish, or I'm being self-protective, or I'm being fearful, even. It involves understanding when we're patient, enduring hardships when we're patient, consistently responding with kindness and care when we're patient. This scriptural view encourages parents to see patience as a virtue. Now, virtue is it's a sign of integrity, goodness, rightness. It, it doesn't mean you're a, a holier-than-thou individual, but it does mean that there's integrity there that if I make a mistake, I can admit it and I can try harder to do better for the next time so I don't keep repeating it. That's a virtue and a tangible expression of love. It all comes back to love, doesn't it? God's patience is the model for that. His, his patience models love, and His love models patience. The Bible frequently depicts a patient God, particularly with His children, the Israelites. We're all God's children when we believe in Christ. When we accept that adoption into His family, we're all his children, and he wants to treat us as a loving parent. And we learn from that and pass it along. So, love him with all our heart and all our might. He goes on to say, love one another in a similar way. God's patience with Israel is profound in the Old Testament, a testament to his enduring love despite their regrettable and repeated disobedience. Over and over again, if you read the book of Judges in the Old Testament, you see this up and down, up and down. They love him, then they drift away, and they want to be like everybody else, and then they get threatened and near annihilation. They turn back to God to help them. He rescues them. They love him again. And it's just that up and down cycle. Now, when I first read that the first time, I. I got saved, I was a Christian, I started reading the Bible, and I read that, I said, well, you know, how, they, how can they do that? You know, why didn't they just stick it out and all that? And as I got older and more experienced, I realized we all do the same thing. It's, it's not just them. All of us do the same thing. We get complacent. As things are doing all right, we kind of get complacent. We, oh, I don't need to do this anymore. I don't need to do that anymore. And then troubles occur and, oh, God help me. You know, God, God get me through this, you know, and he helps and he gets us through. And we love him for a while and now we're getting complacent again. And so on. we do the same thing. It's not just them, it, but it's a lesson that we're learning about that to help us to understand we don't have to be that way, but we have to work hard not to be that way. And in the same way, in parenting, we're training the children in enduring, in being resilient, but in staying the course of being right and doing right. God's patience with Israel teaches us those examples. For instance, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30, it states, For many years you were patient with them. Speaking to God, many years he was patient with them. By your spirit you, were warn you warned them through your prophets. Yet they paid no attention, so you gave them into the hands of the neighboring people. In other words, if you're not going to learn the lesson, then I'm just going to let it go and let you experience the consequence uh, so that you can learn the lesson. And that's what happens to us. If we don't learn a lesson, well, we're going to experience consequences to it. If we are right all the time and we don't believe anything else and, and we're rigid and legalistic, there's going to be consequences. Okay, you experience it. Am I going to learn from it now? Am I going to change? Am I going to improve? Am I going to thrive? And if I do, 
those around me are going to thrive as well, including my children. This divine patience serves as a model for parents. Just as God shows patience with his often wayward children, that's you and I, parents are called to mirror this attribute in their relationship with their children. God's patience with humanity underscores his deep love and commitment, providing a template for parental patience. He's being a loving parent to us, an unconditional loving parent to us. He wants us to be the same with one another, but with our children in particular, be that unconditional loving parent. Yeah, you might not like what they're doing at the moment. Now, how can I teach them to do better? How can I teach them to make those changes? We have that example in Jesus. And that's what the New Testament's all about. Giving us that example of God on earth in human form, living, eating, playing, or having activities together, doing things together. The example of doing right in difficult situations. The life and ministry of Jesus Christ provides the ultimate example of patience. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus demonstrates immense patience with his disciples, the crowds and the adversaries. And I, I read scripture over and over again, and I, I think, oh, you know, I don't know if I'd have the patience to say that, or if I could just, you know, not say anything, or if I can just walk away, you know, I might have to, you know, oh, I should, you know, I think of all these things you want to say, especially if a car pulls out in front of me, uh, you know, well, what's, what's that person thinking? You know, how dare they pull out in front of me? Uh, I'm, I'm goal oriented. I want to get to where I'm going and you're interrupting where I'm going. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for teaching me patience. Now reframe it. All right. I'm learning patience here. Just calm down, be at ease. Same thing with our kids. I'm learning patience here. Look, they spilled the milk all over the floor. <sighs> Thank you, Lord, for this lesson in patience. Yeah, reframe it and it helps you to get through it. Despite the frequent misunderstandings and failures, Jesus patiently taught and guided his disciples. Their misunderstandings, their failures, it takes a while for us to learn new things. And when we've been set in a certain pattern of being modeled a certain way, it takes a little longer to learn new things. And that's a journey for the rest of our life. So we may learn by looking back on our parenting and saying, I could have done this better, I could have done that better. Now with what I'm learning and realizing, maybe I can pass it along to my grandchildren as I'm being a grandparent, or I can pass it along to friends or family or others in helping them to learn what I've learned by looking back. Even though I might have done something wrong, uh, now I realize, oh, I should have done that different. Okay, here, I can pass this along now. In his passion and crucifixion, Jesus exemplified patience under immense suffering, showing restraint and forgiveness. That's a big one, isn't it? Forgiveness. Well, there's practical implications of patience in parenting. And as I said earlier, it's training. It, it, it's doing something wrong, saying, oh, you know, that didn't work out very well. How can I improve on that for the next time? And you improve on it. You do better for the next time. And the kids see that and they recognize that. From a practical standpoint, patience in parenting manifests in various ways, including discipline, communication, and emotional support. So often I get adults talking about their childhood and their punishing parent, uh, or we could say abusive parent, or just a parent who just didn't, didn't know better, and the damage that was done as a result of it all. And I look back and I realize, well, I'm, I'm glad the Lord helped me to, to teach this or to express this or that so that 
everyone doesn't have to be that way in parenting. Uh, if for the, uh, just if my boys, uh, if, if, if one didn't like the other and, and they, they were, you know, uh, expressing their uh, displeasure, you know, and I, we'd remind them, now, you're, you're brothers, you're always going to be brothers, you love each other, you know, go sit down on the couch. I'd make them sit down on the couch and, and hold, hand, hold their hand for 10 minutes, you know, maybe 10 minutes. And, and I'd say, okay, you have to hold hands for 10 minutes now. Uh, that that's that's your consequence, you know, to teach you to learn to love each other, you know, and think good thoughts about each other. And if you're struggling and if you're squeezing or whatever, it's I'm going to add five minutes to it. You know, and it, it got the message across. I didn't have to spank them or um, yell and scream, but you know, sometimes we do. But sometimes you just have to give give a consequence in a natural way. Natural consequences as an example might be you tell your child put your shoes on put your shoes on put your shoes on and they don't put their shoes on and they stub their toe oh i stubbed my toe yeah well you don't spank them because they stubbed their toe because they weren't listening to you their natural consequence is the toe hurts and they're never going to forget that the toe hurts now if they don't learn from that and they continue to walk around in, in the rocky places or whatever without their shoes on, well, they're going to continue to experience the hurt. But if they're still not learning from that, you don't want them damaged. So, okay, I'm going to have to give a consequence here. Um, you're going to have to put your shoes on, sit on, the, sit on the chair for 10 minutes, thinking about how important your toes are. Count each toe and tell each toe you're sorry and take care of your toes. There's a lesson there. They, they, they learn that and they, I don't wanna do that again. You know, and it makes it a little easier to think to put the shoes on, doesn't it? Now that's a little silly, but it works. Think of ways of giving consequences that are more uh, conducive to learning and thriving, growing, building resilience, instead of consequences that push the child away or uh, generate uh, adversarial consequences. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, don't exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in a training and instruction of the Lord. This verse highlights the importance of nurturing children without provoking frustration or anger, which requires significant patience. So I tell you, if the kid's getting really upset and all that, you need significant patience at those times. Yet if you're promoting that by being nasty or being mean or being unkind or whatever it might be, you're only making it hard on yourself it becomes more difficult for you to be patient as a result. Discipline, a critical aspect of parenting, should be administered with patience and understanding, not with anger. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21 echoes this sentiment when it says, Fathers, don't embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. Think back in your childhood were there times when a parent embittered you? Did you feel encouraged by it? Did you feel loved by it? Did you feel good as a result of it? Or did it embitter you? Did it make you feel rejected, unloved, invalidated, and whatever else? Gee, if it did that, then maybe there's something wrong in the way the parent dealt with something with you, then don't repeat it. Don't do the same to your kids or to your grandkids or, or to friends and family. Effective discipline involves calm, consistent guidance rather than reactive or harsh punishment. Patience enables parents to teach their children right from wrong, fostering respect and learning rather than fear and resentment. With parenting, endurance in trials will often be called upon. And if I'm parenting 
in love, I'm teaching myself endurance. I'm teaching myself to be stronger in the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, I'm going to endure more. I'm going to be better able to handle the difficult circumstances that will be coming in the future. As I'm coaching, and I said, we said this last time, as I'm coaching, I'm learning. As I'm teaching, I'm growing in knowledge. I'm growing in experience. I'm growing in insights. So my judgment is going to be improving as a result. The know-it-all person, the entitled person, are they growing and learning? No, they're staying the same. They're bullying their way through life and they're constantly hitting their head against the wall. And there's constant consequences as a result of it. Forgiveness is a key. When I look back on parenting, I think something that stands out is I gotta let go. I gotta not sleep on this. I gotta not think about this, not let it bother me. I've got to reframe it into realizing they're just kids. The brain hasn't even fully formed. It's not until they're 16 years old that the brain, the last pound of the brain fully forms. And then between 16 and roughly about 25 years old, the information is being pulled into that, the, that brain. Uh, all the, 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 the thoughts, the knowledge, the uh, uh, the, the pathways are, are all now gelling together. It's not until 25 when that occurs. I'm less idealistic at that age when before I knew it all, before I had all the answers and so on and so forth. And so we suddenly become real in the mid 20s, maybe even the early 30s. It's a developmental process. But until then, we may need some help. We may need to be open to guidance, to uh, listening to our parents if they're wise and pay attention to them, listening to others who are wise, who made good decisions and so on, learning from them because I'm gelling and I wanna gel sooner than later. Patience involves forgiving others and bearing with their weaknesses, reflecting God's patience with humanity. Well, next time we're going to continue with talking about patience in part two, where we're going to cultivate patience. We're going to talk about some of the strategies in developing uh, calmness and resilience uh, in our parental mindset. I have an announcement to make. Uh, our, my new book uh, was just released, Unmasking Addiction, and, and uh, it's available on to your Amazon and all that. It, it, it's uh, uh, a book on um, exploring the depths of obsessions uh, and uh, passing uh, that, uh, uh, being able to pass that along to others. It's all about the basics of addiction, the uh, importance of the process of healing, of treatment, um, of recovery. And, and I think it'll be something that not only you'll learn from, but you'll be able to pass along to others. Not only the layman, not only the addict in recovery, but also the professionals um, in seeing the research that I put in this, uh, pulling research from, from the researchers uh, into the book and helping to see what are they all saying? What are they discovering uh, regarding addictions and how it can be better treated? I hope you enjoy the book and uh, gain valuable insights once you've finished, I'd uh, greatly appreciate your thoughts and feedback, including online reviews. Um, and you can get that as a Amazon um, and uh, uh, other book uh, sellers. May your troubles be minor, blessings more, and happiness come through your door. God bless.